Welcome, Base Church. We're really excited to bring this resource to you. Trust you're going to enjoy it. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Base Service Online. And um, we are very excited this morning that we get to share the Word of God together. And uh, even though we are all in different locations, we still uh, do this corporately, and we pray that that Word of God would wash over us and change us for His glory. Amen. Now, church, um, I've been given um, a very interesting scripture and very timely scripture to share with you all. And um, this is found in Hebrews 10, verse 25, and I'm reading from the Message Bible. So let's do it. Full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshipping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, that is such a good encouragement for us. Let us see how inventive we can be in keeping in touch with one another and spurring each other on and encouraging one another during a, a, a difficult time like this. Um, if I could just share from my personal life in, in this past week, we've been on lockdown, we've been stuck at home. The calls um, that I've been having with fellow Christians, just uh, having a chat, sharing how um, things are going, the difficulties and the victories, and um, just encouraging one another, praying for one another. Uh, the the midweek prayer meeting, the online prayer meeting that happens at 6.30 uh, on a Wednesday morning. What good times those are and what refreshing times, but what sustaining times they are to get us through a difficult place uh, such as we're in at the moment. And um, as I'm talking to you, I know that there's a lot of people out there that are facing uh, maybe uncertainty. Uh, they're facing situations that are leaving them anxious and um, it's so easy to fall into depression or wrong thinking patterns. Now, if I can just encourage you, be inventive in contacting people, uh, video calls, um, whatever you need to do to make contact with like-minded Christians out there. And definitely, this is one of the ways that you keep yourself moving forward. This is one of the ways that you keep yourself strong by uh, entering into um, what the church is doing, uh, by, by, by following the praise and worship songs that are coming up and, and, and being, being refreshed by His Word this morning. So if I could just encourage everybody just with that scripture. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I just also want to encourage you that uh, this is, um, uh, there is still the opportunity to give. Uh, giving often um, allows the Lord to bless us. It, it allows us to um, show the Lord our love and our obedience by, by giving to Him. And I just like to, uh, to, and the school is still allowing us that opportunity to give. So by all means, um, if you could follow the instructions that are on the screen at the moment and be faithful with your tithes and your offerings um, this, this, this week. Um, and just also, if I could uh, just draw to your attention, if you are needing to contact the church, if you're needing some help in accessing the, 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 the Bible, um, in accessing the prayer meetings, in accessing the, the, the church services, please contact the numbers and, and the details that are showing on the screen right now and um, someone will, will, will be available to assist you to make sure that you are being able to, to, to connect. Um, now this morning we are so privileged and pleasure uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, announce our speaker for the week, our speaker for this Sunday, for the word that will carry us through this week. And that is uh, none other than the teacher, Mr. Andre Mostert. And I'm going to hand over to Andre for this for today's message. Thank you, Andre. Good morning. Welcome to the beginning of the second phase of lockdown as we face the second wave of the coronavirus pandemic. With the intensification of isolation and the increased restrictions on work and movement, I'd like to speak about the grace of God in our relationship with Him, and especially in our relationships with one another. All the major humanitarian organizations operate on a fundamental assumption 
of the value of an individual life and the respect for human rights. Where does this value originate? It is certainly not derived from a materialist evolutionary ethos. At its most extreme, materialism denies the unique position of humankind and refutes the value of the individual. The materialist worldview says that we've all evolved from a primordial soup and humans are just another species of animal, evolved by chance with no special purpose, place or meaning. And overpopulation by the human species is threatening the balance of the global ecosystem. And no individual be a human being has any intrinsic value above that of any individual of any other species. In fact, secular humanists and materialists strongly support abortion and euthanasia because the individual has no value and can or must be sacrificed for the good of the many. The origin of human rights is biblical. Although the derivation has been obscured or erased in the mission statements of most of the secular humanitarian NGOs, the Bible teaches that human life has value because from the beginning we were made in the image and likeness of God. Our worth and value as people come from God. The current generation is not the first to wrestle with this whole concept. Millennia ago, the writer of Psalm 8 asked the question, what is mankind that you're mindful of them and human beings that you care for them? In verse 4. In Psalm 139, David says that God oversees the formation and development of each of us individually from the moment of conception. As individuals, we are formed and fashioned by God. Jesus taught that we are known by God and valued by him. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 29, he said, you can buy two sparrows for only a copper coin and yet not even one sparrow falls from its nest without the knowledge of your father. Aren't you worth much more to God than many sparrows? And despite our rebellion against God and our determination to go our own way, because of our value to him, Jesus came to die at Calvary as the price for our redemption. Alistair McGrath, professor of science and religion at Oxford said, within each of us exists the image of God, however disfigured and corrupted by sin it may presently be. God is able to recover this image through grace as we are conformed to Christ. So even though we are undeserving, we are saved by grace through faith. William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury during World War II said, My worth is what I am worth to God. And that is a marvelous great deal for Christ died for me. Thus, incidentally, what gives to each of us his highest worth gives the same worth to everyone. In all that matters most, we are equal. So, most believers are trying to follow Paul's instruction to the Colossians to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. <laughs> All of us have variable success, and it can be discouraging when we fall short. But C.S. Lewis said, that an awareness of sin is in itself reassuring. He wrote it as, when we notice the dirt that God is most present in us, it is a very sign of his presence. Yeah, I think what he's meaning is that God's holiness reveals our shortcomings, and we can only be aware of his holiness when he's present in us. We're all flawed and in dire need of grace. Our whole relationship with God is entirely based and dependent on his grace, his unearned mercy and forgiveness toward us. As Carl Truman says in his book, Grace Alone, grace is a doctrine that touches the very depths of human existence because it not only reveals to us the very heart of God, but draws us back into the precious communion with him that was so tragically lost at the fall. All our relationships are based on and dependent on grace. First and foremost, our relationship with God the Father. To quote Carl Truman again, it is because we are saved by grace that grace then works in our lives to accomplish God's purposes for us. The Christian life originates in God's grace and is lived by God's grace. What is true of our relationship with God is also true of all our other relationships. Successful marriages, families, friendships, and business relationships survive because of grace. And all relationships present us with multiple opportunities to take offense, to separate from the offender. 
It is our decision to walk worthy of our calling, to extend grace to the wrongdoer, whether it's real or perceived, is the foundation of enduring relationships. In each of our relationships, we often have little understanding of the wounding, the struggles or the pressure with which people are wrestling at any given moment. And so we need to be careful how we respond to or judge the other person. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 2, Jesus taught that you'll be judged by the same standard that you've used to judge others. The measurement you use on them will be used on you. We all face similar battles and we have similar failures. The biblical principle taught by Jesus in Luke chapter 6 and verse 37 is, Do not judge others self-righteously, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others when you are guilty and unrepentant, and you will not be condemned for your hypocrisy. Pardon others when they truly repent and change, and you will be pardoned when you truly repent and change. That's the amplified version. My mother used to quote a proverb that she had learned from her mother. It said, there is so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best that it ill behooves the most of us to pass judgment on the rest. William Shakespeare showed this principle in his play, Henry V. In the prologue to Act Chapter 2, Chorus reveals that Henry is almost ready to invade France, but the French have found some corrupt English noblemen, Richard, Earl of Cambridge, Henry Lord Scrope of Masham and Sir Thomas Grey of Northumberland and have bribed them to kill Henry just before he leaves for France. At the beginning of Act 2 and Scene 2, in Southampton, King Henry prepares his armies to sail for France. A conversation between Gloucester, Exeter and Westmoreland reveals that Henry has discovered the treachery of Cambridge, Scrope and Grey, but the tra traitors do not yet know it. Henry enters with these three and he asks their advice on a case. A drunken man was arrested the previous day for insulting Henry in public. Henry intends to release him, but Cambridge group Scrope and Grey protest and advise him not to show mercy. As so often with Shakespeare, there's humour and irony in the dialogue. Scrope says, he, must, he should be punished, your majesty. If we tolerate such behaviour, we're in danger of encouraging it. Cambridge then says, Your Highness could be merciful but still punish. And Gray says, It would be merciful to let him love after you've beaten him severely. And Henry responds to the traitors by saying, Your great love and concern for my well-being cause you to deal too harshly with this poor man. If minor offences caused by drunkenness cannot be tolerated, then how will we punish serious crimes that are carefully and deliberately planned? Now I'll release the man, even though Cambridge, Scrope and Grey in their extreme concern for my safety would prefer that he be punished. Henry orders the man's release and then tells Cambridge, Scrope and Grey that he's discovered their intended assassination and handing them documents with the incriminating evidence. Shakespeare is illustrating the biblical teaching, for in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. When the three would-be assassin, assassins beg for mercy, Henry asks them how they can possibly ask mercy for treason when they think that an ordinary drunkard deserves no mercy. Henry can hardly believe their betrayal, especially by Scrope, who had been such a close friend and confidant, and he orders the trio to be tortured and executed. The fact is that grace is uncommon, and it is distinctive in many ways to Christianity. Other religions have good morals and good people, but no other religion has an emphasis on grace comparable to that found in the Bible. In Grace Alone, Carl Truman says, Grace is the heart of the Christian gospel. One of my favorite Christian authors, Philip Yancey, grew up in the American South where his family were members of a fundamentalist church with a very legalistic doctrine. In his book, What's So Amazing About Grace?, he describes how after attending Bible school of the same fundamentalist denomination, he left the church because he saw so little grace in it. Several years later, he returned to faith in Jesus because he found it nowhere else. As part of our witness to the goodness of God, we are to be examples of grace to one another. We are recipients and beneficiaries of God's grace. 
as sons and daughters of the God Most High and ambassadors of reconciliation, we should demonstrate His grace daily in our relationships. Not only because we're showing His nature, but because we're in continual need of His grace ourselves. I don't think that there is any relationship where there is a greater need to receive and give grace than in marriage. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that marriage is a mystery that illustrates the relationship between Christ and his body, the church. And we cannot truly understand marriage without looking at the gospel. Paul says that as husbands, we are to love our wives as Jesus loved his bride, and we are to extend grace to our spouse in the same way that the church receives grace from him. Grace in marriage is a two-way street. Husbands need just as much grace from their wives, or maybe more. Jerry Falwell said, if your wife doesn't treat you as she should, be thankful. You might not like what you deserve. I'm not sure any marriage that can survive and thrive without liberal amounts of grace. As we grow and adapt in marriage, there are countless opportunities to hurt and offend one another. Lindy and I recently celebrated an anniversary, and one of the messages I received said, Congratulations! It's so great to find that one person you want to annoy for the rest of your life. <laughs> it is sort of funny, but only because it contains so much truth. I hope none of us get married with the intention of annoying our spouse, but because we're all fundamentally selfish by nature, it happens in the course of life. In his book, The Meaning of Marriage, Tim Keller says, The reason that marriage is so painful and yet wonderful is because it is a reflection of the gospel which is painful and wonderful at once. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. And yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. We've all had those discussions about the toilet seat or the toothpaste tube or the position of the toilet roll. You know, the really important stuff. So how do successful marriages cope with the myriad of petty irritations and major offences? By grace. By giving one another the value of their intentions and not merely the outcome of their actions. Understanding intentions requires communication and knowledge and understanding of one another. So how do we find the capacity to show grace to others? In the first letter of John, the apostle teaches that we love because God first loved us. The Passion Translation says it this way, Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. And in the same way, we show grace. Because we have been shown grace. And the greater our appreciation of how much grace we have received, the more we will be willing to give grace to others. Rick Warren wrote, When you've experienced grace and you feel like you've been forgiven, you're a lot more forgiving of other people. You're a lot more gracious to others. I think, or I believe, that we all have a deep awareness of our need for grace, even though it may not be a conscious understanding. And to be the recipient of grace from others is to experience the touch of God and to glimpse his love and mercy. We show who God is when we share with others the grace that we have been given. Jesus taught us, Freely you have received, freely give. And we cannot excuse withholding grace from others who may have injured or offended us when we have received so much grace from God. Grace is attractive. As Kyle Eidelman said, God's grace is compelling when it is explained, but it is irresistible when it's experienced. And it is in the giving of grace that we most clearly show the face of God to others. It is grace freely given that illustrates the glory of the gospel. Giving grace to others is neither costless nor easy, and it requires more of us than we're generally willing to give. But it is the work and the experience of God's grace in us that enables us to give grace to others. We are completely unable to summon up the will to be gracious to others. It's only as we grow in our experience and knowledge of God's grace towards us that we are enabled in our gratitude to give of his abundance to others. In closing, I'd like to quote Alexander White. What is grace? Grace is love. 
But great is is not love simply and purely and alone. Grace and love are in the innermost essence, one and the same thing. It is in giving grace to others that we demonstrate the practical, concrete way the glory and the power and the love of God to others. I hope you have a fantastic week. And I hope that with all the stresses and strains that we're all feeling with lockdown and the extension of the restrictions that we're facing, that when you face challenges, that you will receive the grace God gives us and that you would be a conduit of grace to those around you. To God first, to your spouse, to your family, to your friends and to your colleagues. And that in that way you would demonstrate God's love to others. Thank you. Have a great week. Well, we thank God for his word this morning and um, a big thank you to Andre for being his vessel. And um, we just pray that that word would take root in our hearts and that we would uh, live in this grace that uh, the Lord has given us. And um, especially that we would be uh, people of purpose, that we would um, be used by God for his purposes in this time. And this is such an important time in the history of 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 mankind I, I think these are really important times so thank you andre for that word and um i'm just going to pray right now lord god we thank you for your word and we know that your word uh does ne- never returns to you void lord god never returns to you without accomplishing that which you have set it out to do father and we pray that we would be fertile soil this morning for your word and we pray that your word will bear fruit um 20 40 and 100 fold lord god and we just thank you that um lord you would keep your people throughout this week bless them encourage them father bless them to be a blessing to others lord we thank you for all of this um and uh we we, we praise your name in jesus mighty name we pray amen have a good week church thank you